So, Benjamin Franklin. Possibly the most quoted public figure of his generation, Benjamin Franklin, or our really idea of him at least, has endured within the public imagination since his death in 1790. From namesakes in operas to features within popular comedy shows, Franklin has continued to transcend class, generation, generation and genre as a recognizable figure and symbol of national identity to almost fabled proportions. So in this presentation today, I'll be exploring how he has gained this status and why, despite this status as a pop culture icon, he was cut from perhaps the most famous of all pop culture pieces on his generation, Hamilton. But first things first, let's go back to the beginning. Where did this all start? Freely admitting that humility is not his strong point, in this statement of purpose on his autobiography's first page, Franklin explains that future generations might take an interest in his story on account of his having emerged from the poverty and obscurity in which I was bred to a state of affluence and some degree of reputation in the world. This references the hard work which enabled his rise from lack of formal education and an almost penniless departure from Boston at the age of 17 to his retirement in Philadelphia at the age of 42 as a wealthy and notable businessman. From the start, the popularity of this autobiography and another of his works, The Way to Wealth, nurtured generations of Americans whose obsession with wealth, success, and upward mobility made them especially interest in Franklin's views of diligence and frugality. As long as people continue to believe in the dream of indiv individual success and mobility, his example of self-help and self-determination will remain an inspiration. He has become the epitome of a self-made man, one whose patriotic, virtuous, self-sufficient and industrial values mimic those of the American dream and the idea of a perfect American citizen. In addition, unlike some of the other founders, he achieved within science, literature and public affairs. His wit and personal qualities that present him as more humanly than the other men of his cohort mean that his popularity is not limited to those of the same status. Ordinary and common people can sympathize and relate to him and his achievements. And he has even gained the popular nickname Ben within households across the world. Franklin molded and controlled his own legacy. Thus, even today, students are taught the autobiography in order that they might learn this democratic vision of American potential, ensuring that they grow up with an image, the, with an image of the popular Franklin figure that we know today. So how exactly did Franklin emulate the American dream? Franklin's vision of himself as a self-made man is inextricably lit, tied up with that of the American dream. The Amer idea of the American dream is rooted in the second sentence of the Declaration of Independence, which states that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The image of America as a country of unlimited opportunities and attainable wealth radically contrasted that of the European world, where social status was based explicitly on hereditary and not on personal accomplishment. A so-called safe self-made man exemplifies this. Traditionally used as a safeguard against social and economic security, a self-made man is a person who successfully completes the transition from dependence to independence and earns their wealth through hard work alone. The values are therefore attainable and accessible by all, regardless of class and background. The image of Franklin therefore sparked the trend for popular writers to craft a figure who was less of a man and more of an idolized statue on someone who had figured, who had achieved the American dream through his hard work and virtues of frugality, honesty, and integrity. Of course, the fact that his appearance is instantly recognizable, perhaps more so than any other founding father, is also a huge benefit to his legacy. With his long hair, bald on top, buckled shoes and round bifocal glasses, his image was carefully crafted so that now, wherever he pops up, we instantly know who he is. 
The image of him has become so fam familiar to us over the years as he, is as he has been present in pocket since 1914 when his first, he first appeared on the $100 bill and even earlier when he featured on the first postage stamp in 1847. Franklin has since appeared on more stamps than any other person besides Washington, and these images of him pop up frequently, whether on purpose or not, within novels, novel, movies, and other popular media, cementing our, his image into our mental photo libraries and positioning himself firmly into the daily unconscious landscape for a large proportion of Americans, becoming a true symbol of national identity. Even here, as we look at the portraiture we have of him, his image appears fluid and does not present as a statue-like or frozen in time as some of the other founding fathers or notable historic figures. His different personas as a man of science, an engineer, a revolutionary and self-made man offer endless context for him to pop up in and props to identify himself by when featuring him within imagery and the popular imagination. So how has all of this presented itself within popular culture? This timeline shows a selection of media that Franklin has made an appearance in throughout the last century. So by the end of the 19th century, we have chronicles of Franklin's life already featuring within popular writing, serving as instructive examples to children, men, and immigrants as to how to mold themselves into ideal American citizens. So with the turn of the 20th century and the dawn of more popular forms of entertainment, such as film, music and radio, Franklin's visual image has been accelerated into fame. It was also around this time that a confluence of factors in popular American culture also led to a transformation in Franklin. He went from being an elusive figure to a personable one, someone who can interact with people at all social levels. This content remained largely the same in terms of documenting his rise from escaped apprentice to master printer, his scientific and technological achievements and his role in the nation's founding. But he was also humanized and could start making appearances as a time travel traveler and a friendly character for comedic purposes. So for example, we have the moder moderately successful 1964 Broadway musical, Ben Franklin in Paris. This starred Robert Preston in the title role and had Franklin dropping poor Richard Maxims and jokes and successfully pursuing his diplomatic ends by wooing a courtier. And that does bring us to briefly mentioning his reputation with women. Over the past half a century, this part of his life has been a hot topic and one that captures the popular imagination. That interest in women has been the most signal development in changing perceptions of Franklin after, over the past half a century. And though academics have always gone to great lengths to argue that Franklin's flirtations were just that, the media does not care so much for historical accuracy. And this has offered up in another amusing route in which we can feature Franklin within otherwise ordinary circumstances. And it was this uh, exact association that led to his 2007 appearance in the US office, a feature that would cause audiences all around the world to see Franklin in a new hilarious context. But kids have also been spoilt with many fictional takes on a logical, cheerful, good-humoured and patient Ben Franklin. None are more popular than writer and artist Robert Lawson's 1939 Ben and Me, which has gone through dozens of printings and has even been selected as an exemplary American children's book. Ben and Me features a mouse named Amos, who is the real brains behind a well-meaning and industrious, but also bumbling Franklin. Disney's, Disney's 1953 20-minute animated adaptation of Ben and Me for the big screen focused on uh, primarily on the mouse behind the man, but it also emphasised Franklin's kite experiment. Franklin's range of accomplishments was also the prime reason that television producer Kevin O'Donnell specifically chose Franklin as the central adult in the 2002 40-part PBS animated series Liberty's Kids. Voiced by Walter Cronkite, here a gentle, wise and avicular Franklin is celebrated for his contributions to science, to the postal service, to Philadelphia, to music, as well as to the cause of the American Revolution. It is clear that Franklin is seen as a worthy character that children should and can aspire to. And he is also one whose versatile persona has been able to bridge both high-minded productions as well as more standard popular fare. 
But how accurate is our popular image of Franklin to the real thing? We know that Franklin, whether in fashion or in his literary works, liked to create different identities for himself. From a middle-aged widow to a rugged American frontiers man, his imagination knew no bounds, and the images that he created for himself have lasted far beyond his own lifetime, so that even the most gifted of scholars seem unable to answer the question of who he really was. For example, Wright has said, Franklin is his own creation, obscuring himself behind public images. We do not know what is fact and what is fiction. And CV has said, his greatest achievement was the creation of himself. Celebrity can rely on sentimental attachment to a person. In this respect, Franklin is the perfect candidate with a ready stream of quotes available, regardless of whether or not he was actually the one to say them. These have been used on co in conversations on a daily basis. We also have his more eccentric personality and associations. It's become almost cool and trendy to like Franklin and think of him as a pure expression of enlightened 18th century American society. His reputation in many ways eclipsing his actual accomplishments and achievements. And Franklin's recent fictional life has threatened to outshine his historical one. So, despite this popularity, why then did he not feature in Hamilton? Hamilton, the smash hit musical by Lin-Manuel Miranda about Franklin's fellow founding father, Alexander Hamilton, is notable in, it, in its omission of Franklin. So why was he left out? In fact, Benjamin Franklin was originally intended to appear in Hamilton, albeit in a less prominent role than some of the other founding fathers. A solo called Ben Franklin's Song was even planned and written before being cut very early on by Miranda. And let's also not forget that he does get a few mentions within songs. So, as you can see here, we have It's Ben Franklin with a kite in a key, you see it right, in Satisfied. And also, the petition was written and signed by Benjamin Franklin, It Cannot Go Ignored, in Cabinet Battle Number 3. But it's really not that extensive. There are in fact many full reasons why the character Franklin was erased from the show. For one, the show is set from 1776 to, to 1804. From 1776 to 1785, Franklin was in Paris service, serving as ambassador to France, and so would in fact be absent from the entire of Act One, as he would be too far removed from the show's action in the United States. Miranda himself is quoted, quoted as saying, that we can jump across the ocean once for King George, but I think if you jump across the ocean twice, it feels as though you're losing focus. Also, as the oldest founding father and approximately 50 years Hamilton senior, he died shortly after in 1790, which would have been between cabinet battle number one and cabinet battle number two, the second and seventh songs of act two. Therefore, other than at the constitutional convention, where he was actually pretty unwell, they didn't really intersect that well, that much. So there's not a lot of common ground to work with in their stories, and he could only have actually featured in a very small window of activity. And of course, there's also the issue that as a musical so densely packed with history and politics and philosophy, adding a character so multifaceted as Franklin may have just been too overwhelming to the audience. Though not all was lost, as in 2016, Miranda did contact the Decembrists front leader, Colin Malloy, to offer the band the discarded song to record. Recognising that Franklin was, a, was, a, was of a completely different generation to the rest of the founders, Miranda did not feel that rap music was necessarily relevant, and therefore the song is actually rather folky. And I have a little bit of the song to play for you now so that you can hear it. Set us free. Invest in my. Race. 
And I'm going to very quickly stop it there because uh, it gets quite explicit. So <laughs> I don't think it's uh, necessarily um, appropriate for this presentation. Um, but if you do want to listen to the rest of the song, um, do uh, go and watch it on YouTube because, um, yeah, uh, it is uh, quite, quite, quite a fun song to listen to. Um, but uh, in terms of actually uh, what Franklin would have thought of it, um, I'm not sure he would have um, necessarily approved uh, because it is pretty damning to him and um, sees him boasting about his accomplishments and romantic conquests, lamenting the story of his, his illegitimate son, who was a British loyalist, and perpetuates the seduction myth that historians have been trying to tame for years. Uh, so uh, perhaps in hindsight, it's actually best for his reputation that it was left out after all. But if you really are desperate to see a musical depiction of what Franklin was up to during Hamilton, look no further than the aforementioned Ben Franklin in Paris the fictionalized account of Benjamin Franklin's adventures in the French capital. Though I think you'll have to wait for it as a re for a revival as it's not actually been performed professionally since 2008. <laughs> Despite his omission from Hamilton, no other American life is as often reinterpreted as Franklin's, as each generation gets to discover Ben anew and then redefine him for their own times. In particular, for the 21st century, his late in life opposition to slavery has put him in what is perceived as a more favorable light compared to some other of his fellow founders. And this has perhaps uh, accelerated his popularity even further. Franklin not only continues to be remembered deeply in terms of continually being a subject of books, documentaries, television shows, and movie, movies, but also broadly across most sectors of the American population and that interest shows no sign of abating soon. A recent survey of 2,000 US high school students and 2,000 American-born adults asked them to list the 10 most famous Americans, not including presidents and their wives. Franklin appeared on 37% of the adults' lists, more than any other figure, and the only one from the 18th century. And he was also on 29% of the students' lists, and the only one whose primary accomplishments came before the mid 19th century. We also have the recent Ken Burns PBS documentary, which charts his life. And this has re-sparked curiosity in his biography and career. And, the, and we also have the upcoming Michael Douglas Apple Plus series charting his late in life success in garnering American independent support from France. So I'm sure that this is short. I'm sure that this is um, to continue the trajectory that we see um, of the interest in Franklin. Safe to say, Franklin remains a distinctive figure within American culture and an icon firmly planted in the national consciousness. So we can be pretty certain that Benjamin Franklin's legacy will continue to be rewritten as the years go by. And I am sure that the next Tony Award winning musical, Franklin, is just around the corner. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, I will now pass on over to any questions. Um, so do put them in the Q&A chat um, if you haven't already. We do have one already come through, uh, so I will um, answer that in a second. But yeah, just let anyone else to uh, submit their questions quickly first. And I will stop sharing my screen too. There we go. Uh, yeah, so uh, we have our first question, uh, which is, what is your fav favorite depiction of Franklin? Um, and uh, yeah, great question. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I think my favorite is um, de definitely um, his feature in the in the office, the US office. Um, I, I don't think you can really get any better than that. If you haven't seen the episode, um, yeah, do watch that because it is um, pretty hilarious. And uh, yeah, kind of sums up what we've been talking about today. Um, just wait to see if there are any other questions coming through. Okay, we have one from uh, Lynn. She says, could you tell me more on who was Ben Franklin's English spiritual son, please? Uh, could you expand on what you mean by spiritual son?
Oh, I think yes. So um, that's fine. Um, so she she uh, she said she thought I had spiritual son, but um, she is French, so she maybe misunderstood. I think perhaps I um, I said illegitimate son. Um, so um, uh, William Franklin was um, Benjamin Franklin's son. Um, who um, he never revealed who who the mother was. Um, so so we don't we don't know who. Um, yeah, we we never found out who that was, um, but um, unfortunately, um, Ben he he became a um, British um, a British royalist uh, loyalist that um, kind of really supported the crown um, when Benjamin Franklin went his own way and um, towards independence, um, and so they fe they fell out um, uh, rather spectacularly, and um, yeah, they they weren't talking towards the end of his life, um, so it's a pretty um, a pretty tragic ending to their relationship, um, seeing as they were um, so close at the beginning of the beginning of their, their lives. Um, but yeah, I think um, I think that's uh, maybe what you meant, hopefully. Um, OK, we have were there any popular depictions of Franklin that you came across in your research that surprised you? Um, yes, uh, there were actually. I was surprised by um, how much he featured within children's um, children's kind of um media um i i didn't know he was so popular as kind of this um kind of figure to inspire towards um uh i think um not coming from obviously an american uh schooling background um i didn't realize he featured so much within like the curriculum and um yeah and that his autobiography was studied and everything um but yeah the fact that there was a disney movie and everything um yeah i i definitely i definitely didn't know that so i was i was very surprised um that he um did feature uh within those things and then we have does 37 6 craven street feature in popular culture outside of franklin house has the house appeared as a setting in of any other media oh yes great question um so um yeah the 37 6 craven street is used for um filming um uh relatively frequently. Um, so um, uh, not necessarily because it's Benjamin Franklin House, just because it's a lovely Georgian townhouse. It obviously, um, it, it's empty. So it's it's great to kind of um, uh, restyle for those for those things. Um, so it was actually used in Alice in Wonderland. Um, the, I can't remember what year it was, but um, the, the recent movie, um, the, uh, oh, I can't remember, I can't remember who, who the director was but um the tim burton tim burton alice in wonderland it was featured featured in that and you can see um you can see that on youtube um it's also had associations associations to harry potter but unfortunately that is that is a myth uh there, there's a bit of a myth going around that um it was used as the inspirational for grimold place um but yeah i'm sorry to say that's that's not true <laughs> um but yeah no definitely um uh, because because of its um, kind of Georgian exterior, it's um, it is used a lot in in uh, film. Which years did Franklin live in London? So he lived in London um, from 1757 uh, until 1775, um, with a brief two year um, gap in between that. So um, uh, yeah, it spanned a total of 16 years. So it was right before the um, signing of the um, Declaration of Independence in 1776. So um, a real kind of pivotal moment in his life and also in the kind of formation of the founding father figure that we know uh, we know and love today. Um, and the one that, uh, yeah, obviously features a lot in, in popular culture. Uh, but he did actually have a brief sprint, uh, uh, stint in London in the 1720s too as a printer's apprentice, um, kind of going back to him uh, as that self-made man, um, he he started off um, kind of very poor in London, um, and um, no one knew who he was um, in the 1720s. Um, so when he returned in 1757, he had a very different experience um, to the one that he'd had as a young man. Uh, do we have any other questions? Give you 10 more seconds. <laughs> okay, we've got one. So did any of the other founding fathers visit him in London? Uh, okay, great. Again, another great question. And um, no, um, um, they, 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 they didn't. Um, he, he was the oldest founding father. He was kind of a completely generate a different generation to um, to the others um and so um 
no, I don't believe I don't believe any of the other others did visit him in London. Um, it was kind of after that point that that the others started making their travels across across to London. For instance, John Adams was here um, in in the seventeen eighties. Um, Jefferson came over at one point, um, but but no, while Benjamin Franklin was here, it was it was just him him over here. Unfortunately, that would um, be a great story to tell in the house. <laughs> Okay, I'll just give you until half past to ask any more questions and then we'll wrap up if not. Aha, Thomas Paine is not represented in Hamilton as well. Why, what is your view on this matter? Oh, great question. Yes, that is, that is a very good point actually. Um, uh, I mean, I imagine kind of uh, a similar, a similar thing to why Benjamin Franklin's not featured. Um, he was kind of almost almost of a different generation. Um, he, he was a bit older than, than kind of Hamilton himself. Um, he was also British again. So um, uh, obviously he, he lived in America um, at, at the end of his life, but um, again, kind of crossing the ocean um, probably would have been too difficult. Um, yeah, and I guess, uh, I guess the focus of Hamilton is more on um, uh, how Hamilton really steered the American Revolution. So maybe maybe Thomas Paine was uh, kind of too big a figure to tackle in that in that respect. Um, but yeah, no great question. That that's that's a talk for another day. I think um, I think that would be really interesting to explore as well. Um, but yeah, I imagine I imagine it's pretty pretty similar reasons. Um, obviously, Hamilton is such a huge musical. It covers such a uh, huge part of American history. Um, and there's there's a whole lot to fit in. Um, so um, I think probably. Um, uh, squeezing anything else in would have been, would have been far too difficult for um, Lima Miranda to do, um, but you never know. Maybe there'll be a sequel, and and we'll have all these characters kind of make a comeback. <laughs> but I'm not sure if there's a song on Thomas Paine. There might be because um, so uh, the song that I played is from a album called Hamill Drops, um, and it's um, kind of all of the songs that uh, never quite made the cut to the actual Hamilton musical um, were, were re-released. Um, so um, do do check that album out because I'm sure there's some kind of great great songs on there um, to look at. Great. So again, another thirty seconds. If there's any more questions. I'll take that as no more questions. So um, yeah, if you if anyone does have any more questions that they 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 want to submit at any time, um, please just um, get in touch with 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 the house. Um, we we um, would will always answer any questions that you do have. Um, so yeah, please do do that. Um, but thank you so much for coming today. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, enjoyed the talk and that you got something out of it. Um, just as kind of heads up of our any future events that we have coming up. So um, actually next week on the tenth and eleventh. Uh, we are um, participating in Open House London. Um, so um, you actually get an exclusive um, opportunity to experiencing, experiencing, experience, sorry, experience the house um, as um, self-guided for the first time ever. So um, if, if you're around in London and you want somewhere free to go, then please do come um, uh, show your support and come to Benjamin Franklin House. Uh, we'll also be running out on the following weekend on the 17th and 18th. Uh, so plenty of opportunity for you to um, you to come to that. It's between 10 and 4 p.m. Um, and then also um, do look out on our website because we'll soon be releasing details on our um, uh, Halloween, Thanksgiving and Christmas events. Um, so, so yeah, do, do keep an eye out for them. And um, hopefully, hopefully we'll see some of you there either um, kind of virtually or, or in person. Um, but yes, thanks again for coming today. Um, I hope everyone has a great evening or day wherever you are in the world. Um, and uh, yeah, hope to see you soon. Bye. <laughs>